Last month, BJ traveled across the United States, performing in Indiana, Illinois, Washington, and Oregon. Next month, we'll be ministering in Michigan, California, and Canada. His contact information is on the uh, brochures that we have in the back, so if you have a, uh, a need to contact him for any reason, you're able to do that. And now, for our service. John Wesley was born in 1703. Probably did more for England than any other figure in British history. He is credited with saving England from the bloody revolution experienced in France. His untiring zeal for God brought about prison reform, child labor laws, orphanages, medical care facilities, and even shelters for battered women. Wesley's, Wesley's methodical ways of Christian discipleship give rise to the term we now use, Methodism. There's a method in Methodism, and that method originated with John Wesley. He is not only the founder of the Methodist Church, but a true champion of Christianity everywhere. The man from Aldersgate with B.J. Johnson has been adapted directly from the journals of John Wesley. So it's now our pleasure to present B.J. Johnson in The Man from Aldersgate. Michael, I will vindicate your name this very day. 
In fact, this very moment, now run along and see to feeding and watering the horses while I pen your good name into the annals of church history. September 14th, 15th, September 15th. September 15th, I left Epworth with great satisfaction and at about five o'clock preached at Clayworth. I think that none there are unmoved. I think that none there were unmoved but Michael Fennec, <laughs> who fell fast asleep beneath a nearby haystack. Ah, well, I suppose I should be taken to a carriage soon. I've noticed in the past several years or so that whenever I ride my customary 20 miles a day, well, they're not making saddles as padded as they once were. Perhaps they're not making me as padded as I once was. But a quarter of a million miles will do that to any man's padding. And yet, in all the 70 years of my lifetime, including the 40 I've lived on the Lord's byways, I've had practically no aches or pains. My health has been nearly perfect all these years, thanks be to God. What's my secret? Just a few simple but regular practices, such as my constant exercise and change of the air. My ability to sleep on command at a moment's notice, day or night, whenever I feel myself almost worn out. The fact that I have never missed a night's sleep, sick or well, on land or at sea. And rising every morning at 4 a.m. and preaching at 5. Do these things and you live long past the time anybody can stand to be with you, too. <laughs> I preached over 42,000 sermons from this faithful old book and still the people keep coming back for more. Just recently at the amphitheater in Gwennett I preached to over 30,000 souls at one time. Now I don't know how many of the books I've read in my lifetime. That's like asking me how many times I've drawn a breath. I've written over 200 myself but as widely read as I am and as widely written I'm still a man of one book. I am a creature of a day passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit from God returning to God. God himself has condescended to teach me the way he has written down in a book. Give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. Here then I am far from the busy ways of man. I sit down alone. Only God is here. In his presence, I open, I read his book. Here I am. I am my Bible. I will not. I dare not vary from this book either in great things or small. I have no power to dispense with one jot or tittle of what is contained therein. 
I am determined to be a Bible Christian, not almost, but all together. Who will meet me on this ground? Will you, sir? Sure? Sure what? Meet me on this ground. Will you, young lady? Yes. yes what? On this ground. Young man, will you? Yes. Yes what? Yes! Meet me on this, or not at all. Oh, such a brook. Deserves to be preached with simpleness of word and directness of logic. I myself seek to so present it, but I am the exception. Unfortunately, the ornate and artificial style of speaking made popular by one Lord Chesterfield is the fact among most ministers. <clears throat> um, let me give you an example. Suppose you, sir, wanted to console me over a personal loss I had just suffered. Instead of saying simply and sincerely, I'm sorry, <clears throat> or I agree with you, the proper etiquette dictates one to respond in this manner. I hope, sir, that you will do me the justice to be persuaded that I am not insensible of your unhappiness. That I take part in your distress and shall be ever affected when you are so. <laughs> Dribble, if I were to use such lengthy muddled prose in my sermons, the devil would have half the congregation slaughtered, butchered, and turned on a spit before I could make my point. And it's how soundly this is the language of these eloquent men, as equally low are their morals. Some are of such a low ebb, it is not uncommon for them to attend and even wager on the cockfights on a given Sunday before conducting the morning worship, rather than seeking to remake the moral climate of the times they go along with it, preferring to rub their hands with the grain of the wood instead of, a, of against it. Perhaps they fear the painful splinters the latter surely brings. But our carpenter's hands are cut and bruised by his trade. Our, our master's hands were so marked with cuts and splinters and even with the mark of the nail. I would not feel fit to call myself a carpenter in God's house unless I too bore such marks. They come with a calling. Crime, vice, poverty, and water are all rampant. Taverns advertise the making drunk for a tuppence. Huh? Give it to me, sir. It says right here, joy comes in the morning. Yes, morning is spelled in two ways. <laughs> ah! Drunk for a tuppence, and for a tuppence more, giving the straw to sleep it off on. Oh, one of the more popular amusements of the times are the public executions at Tyburn. There, half the population of London assembles to watch men, women, and even children hanged for petty crimes. A gently swinging highwayman is a favorite among the crowds, for they leech upon rich and poor alike. Yet, even a highwayman is not beyond God's salvation. I parted with my purse rather abruptly one time in the hands of such a man. Now understand me, money and I have never been the closest of friends. In fact, truth you know, we are scarcely passing acquaintances. <laughs> I've made it a rule of my life to get all I can, to economize, oh, 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 to economize, all I can, and to give, and to give all I can. That's about all I can right now. <laughs> when I first began my ministry to receive but 30 pounds for the year, I lived on 28 and gave away 30 pounds, I lived on 28, I gave away two, very good, now listen carefully, the next year, when I had 60 pounds, I lived on 28 again and gave away 32, the fourth year, I still lived on 28 and gave away 92, if when I die, I leave behind 10 pounds for which I have no use, I would be a greater thief and robber than that highwayman, money never stays with me. 
If we burn every day, I throw it out of my hands as quickly as possible, lest it find a way into my heart. But if you do not spend your money to help others, you will surely spend it to hurt yourself. <laughs> but this particular day, my contributions were anything but voluntary. The man relieved me of every shilling I possessed upon the threat of your money or your life. <laughs> now, I did not press the point that what is mine actually belongs to the Lord. The finer aspects of <clears throat> theology are often lost to one at the point of a gun. But one verse did come to mind. So as the cowled stranger lifted my purse, I said to him, let me speak one word to you. The time may come when you will regret the course of life in which you are now engaged. Remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. No more was said when we parted. I took my way, and I much feared he to go his. Well, I feared for him because I knew his way could only lead to the, the scaffolds of Tyre and the pits of hell. But many years later, I was leaving a church in which I had just preached when a stranger stopped me and introduced himself in a most peculiar manner. He asked me if I remembered the uh, way they at such and such a time and place. Well, I told him that I recollected that I had. For one does not forget the business end of a blunderbuss. That man, he said, and that single verse you quoted on that occasion was the means of a, of a total change in my life and habits. I have long since been in the practice of attending the house of God and of giving attention to his word, and I trust that I am a Christian. Praise be to God. There is no such thing as a hopeless person to him, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I set it. Isaiah 55, 11. And where at, what is the reference? Not Isaiah, sir, it is Isaiah. What is the reference? Everyone together? Memorize it. And whereas God's grace was sufficient to not only protect me from a highwayman, but to also win him over to the faith, it was doubly sufficient to quell the raging, mindless seas of fearful, ignorant men. I speak of the mobs. Mob violence in opposition to the faith has been one of Satan's chief tactics throughout church history. Thus mobs and riots became my club and lot. In one month, in, in uh, 1742, I was threatened by no less than three mobs. Uh, one of them, uh, two of them, one from law school and the other more violent from uh, Winsbury, converged on me as one with a vengeance. Now I did not hide when they approached. But I ventured out to meet them, for it is my rule, confirmed by long experience, always, but always, look them all in the face. I said, Are you willing to hear me? They answered almost as one. No, no, knock his brains out, down with him, kill him at once. <clears throat> one brute struck me several rows from behind with a heavy wooden club. Oak, I believe, though I wished at the time it had been pine. In the turmoil, my voice gave up, but came again later, and I broke out in prayer. Now, the man who headed the mob from Winsbury, a, 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 a large man, violent man, with a neck and hands of an ape, heard my prayer and turned toward me. I looked into the narrow slits of his eyes and then down to the cruel lines of his mouth, certain that the next words uttered from them would be my death sentence. Instead, the awesome power of the Holy Spirit spoke the answer to my prayer. The man said, Sir, I must spend my life for you. Follow me, and not one soul shall touch a hair of your head. <laughs> and so it was. God brought me safe to Wensbury that very day, having lost only one small flap on my escort, and 
with a bit of skin from one of my hands too. And God saw fit to save my pugnacious rescuer as well. Today, he is an able preacher of the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. What are you, a bunch of dolts sitting there quietly? Can you say amen? Amen. So that's what it was. Oh. Hi. You're looking for your mother. <laughs> well, the, the young lady was found, but now the mother is lost. <laughs> Perhaps the two could come together. Ah, oh, there is the mother. The mother has been found. Praise be to God. Strange, my room looked to me all ablaze. 
like a bright burning nightmare swirling all around me. In panic, I rushed into the nursery and climbed upon the chest in front of the windowsill in the garden below. Men, women, children, and howling animals scurried about in terror. I tried to shout to them above the crackling flames, Mother, Father, here I am! Help me! But the noise was too great and my little voice was too small. Then suddenly someone saw my silhouette against the flames, but nobody seemed to know what to do and there was no time to find a ladder. Then suddenly another man came running toward the house and called him to the others. He braced himself against the wall below while another man climbed upon his back until he was standing on his broad shoulders. The top man reached upwards, stretching his arms as he moved to reach me. Thanks to God, the man's arms were just long enough to snatch me out of the window. No sooner was I safe in his arms than the roof above the entire house, nursery and all came in with a tremendous crash of sparks and smoke. I clung to the stranger crying and shaking uncontrollably. When he tried to release me into the arms of another man, I resisted until I saw that the other man was my father. Oh, father was crying too. I was afraid he would crush my small body in his great arms as he hugged me. Then he said, Come, neighbors, come, let us kneel down, let us give thanks to God. He has given me my wife and all my eight children. We have now little more than Adam and Eve had when they went to housekeeping, but let the house burn. I am rich enough. And since that time, my mother has, has impressed upon me that such a deliverance could only mean that God must have some great destiny in store for me, some special work that he had for her, Jackie. And I felt God's calling as strongly as my mother did. And since that day, I have felt like, like a brand plucked from the fire, like a sword tempered by the flames and forged for the Lord to wield in his mighty right hand. And since that day, I have been prepared to cut men's souls It's different as two people could possibly be. 
For instance, in the difficult trying days of our early ministry, Charles would say, well, if the Lord would give me wings, I would fly. I would then reply, brother, if he bid me to fly, I would trust him for the wings. And yet God, in his divine wisdom, has seen fit to use both of us in his great commission. No doubt that one may upset the faults and failings of the other, whatever the case. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 One would think, having been reared in a family such as mine, my conversion would have been a nearly inevitable process. I assure you it was not. For God has only children. Not grandchildren. I fear I am still apt to become a little unnerved when it comes to this particular subject, even after all these years. I have found out through the many years of my ministry that people are generally appalled when I admit to them that I was not a Christian until my 35th year. Oh, yes, it's true. Let me explain. I graduated Oxford University and was honored with a fellowship at Lincoln College. I then took a pastor to the village of Root. Oh, a discouraging, disastrous episode for which I will clarify later. After two years, I returned from Root, deeply troubled over my failure to reach the people of that humble community. In the meantime, Brother Charles, just starting Oxford, began what he called the Holy Club. He sought to that I was immediately elected leader of the Root. We 17 souls applied ourselves and our meager resources toward aiding the plight of the poor in prisons and in the streets. And after six happy years, I was ready to move on. With the Lord's blessing and guidance, of course. I would not have admitted it at the time, but my wanderlust was more personal than providential. You see, I had faithfully endeavored to serve God for nearly a quarter of a century. Thought I'd succeeded as well as most, but for the past several years, I've become completely and unexplainably restless in the service. It was as if I needed a change, or a change. Something seemed to be missing from my life and service for the Lord, and a growing fear told me it was something vital. Thus, I was ready for whatever seemed to me to be the lead of the Lord. Anything at all. I did not have to wait long. Governor James Oglethorpe had just returned with the colony he was busily organizing in America. Does anyone here recall the name of the particular colony in America? Yeah. Georgia, that's correct! Savannah, Georgia! Whatsoever. 
Yes, my father ministered to such unfortunates all his life. In fact, he's always encouraged Charles and I to do the same, which, which we have, which we have. But I don't know, since undoubtedly they are all members of the church already, I don't fail to see any real challenge. Then how would I like to become a missionary to the Indians?
I went to America to convert the Indians and found that I myself was not converted. With all these momentous failures to confront me, I did not need another. For fast. <laughs> but there she was, Miss Sophie Hawking, the 18 year old niece of the bailiff of Sebastian, and the object of my long suppressed love and affection. Oh, what a preposterous and pitiful episode. What a titanic struggle there was between these deep rooted inhibitions and these <coughs> newfound feelings. Only when Sophie herself resolved our entanglement by jilting me to elope with a rival suitor and a convict, no less. Only then did I receive the message, go home, John Wesley, go home. <laughs> so after two frustrating years of beating the air in that unhappy place, I took my final leave. On my return voyage from the colonies, I endeavored I see Michael has fallen asleep again, uh, beneath one of the horses this time. No doubt he's dreaming of listening to one of my more <coughs> spellbinding sermons. You will pardon me, won't you, while I endeavor to give uh, Mr. Fennick a well-deserved break from his rest? But <clears throat> perhaps you would appreciate a break as well. Feel free to stand up, stretch and cross the aisle, greet one another. I shall return presently. Grace not one not. <laughs> Upstream. Yet, the very nature resisted his witness. 
You see, I have been the instructor of debate at Oxford, and when Brother Burns spoke of faith, I countered with my ever drawn sword of argument. But how? How, Peter? How can I really know that I am saved? By faith alone. But what it works, I have always thought to become a Christian through my good works. At Oxford, we have the Holy Club minister to the poor and the sick and the fatherless and the widowed and to those in prison. They are not enough. But what more can one do or be asked to do? But trust in Jesus Christ alone. But I have always held that to become a Christian, one must proceed through an orderly and logical course of good deeds, growing in grace as the years progressed until finally upon completing his life service, God may or may not declare it saved than a Christian. And you stand here and tell me that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am saved here and now? How? How, Peter? How can I really know for certain that I am saved in this life? By trusting in Jesus Christ alone. That's all. That's everything. No, it's too simple, Peter. You see, I've always followed every argument to its logical conclusion. How am I now to purge such a lifetime of orderly discipline in order to accept an assurance of salvation founded on faith in Jesus Christ alone? Where's the proof of my salvation? Yes, the rock I am to base my assurance on. The rock of Jesus Christ. The scriptures, Peter, show me the scriptures. Romans 5 1. Yes. Uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 8 and 9. <coughs> ah. For by grace ye have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should. saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is, the, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. What? Acts 16, 31? I think I am beginning to understand. For three agonizing months I tried to argue with Peter Berler, argue myself out of my own salvation. Thank God I failed at that too. Events began to move more rapidly thereafter. When I initially began to realize the error of my ways, my, my first impulse was to was to cease preaching until my own conversion was complete. But when I asked Brother Berner how I could preach to others when I had no faith myself, he said, Preach faith until you have it. Then because you have it, you will preach it. On March 6th, 1738, I did begin preaching that same faith in Jesus Christ alone. I was banned from two churches on the spot. <laughs> they expected missionary stories from a newly returned missionary, not the gospel of Jesus Christ and their need for salvation. And yet, in spite of my sincere efforts to preach the truth, my, my soul was still rent and ravaged by the truth. 
Now I was ready to follow wherever the Holy Spirit took me. He took me to Aldersgate Street. I woke at 5 o'clock in the morning of May 24, 1738, and found the following words confronting me in the New Testament, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. I close my Bible to meditate upon the words partakers of the divine nature. I opened it again, and this time another verse seemed to virtually leap out at me. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. All the rest of that morning, these two promises filled my mind. In the afternoon, I went to the services held at the last St. Paul's Cathedral. All the ritual was familiar enough, yet somehow it all seemed to have new meaning for me. Surely I thought, this is a most fitting place in which God could reveal himself to me. But it was not the place of God's choosing. I did not know just where I wanted to go that evening, but I knew it was not to another religious service, so I just walked. Eventually, I unwillingly found myself at a meeting on, on Aldersgate Street, where a man was reading Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while Luther's commentary was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away all my sins. It saved me from the law of sin and death. Oh, I began to pray with all my might for those who had in particular despitefully used and persecuted me. Then I, I testified openly what I felt in my heart. Oh, how does one describe such an experience, this new birth in Jesus Christ? Is it like being born again? Well, who can say, who can recall the events of their first birth? Perhaps it is like being an ugly, wrinkled caterpillar, wallowing in the dust all your life, then suddenly becoming a, a beautiful, free-floating butterfly, a creature of the wind, nectar-fed and free. actually felt a presence, his presence, living and striving not only with me, but within me. And here I found the difference between this and my former state, then I was sometimes, if not often, conquered. But now, I was always conquered. My first impulse was to rush and tell the good news to my brother Charles, who had for, for several days been ill. Some of those who had been at the Aldersgate meeting came along, and in a moment my, my brother's sick room was transformed into a sanctuary of joy. As I knelt before his bed, Charles led us in singing a, a hymn he had written only the day before. Where shall my wandering soul begin? How shall I all to heaven aspire? A slave redeemed from death and sin, a brand to life from eternal. Fine. For the second time in my life, I felt like, like a brand plucked from the fire, but this time from the eternal fires of hell and damnation. Praise be to God. Thereafter, our mission was clear. Charles and I were to take the good news of forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ alone to our world. But the established church saw matters in a somewhat different light. 
the half light of legalism. Church after church barred their doors to us until not one in all of London proper would tolerate a Wesley in his pulpit. It happened that one of the former members of our holy club, uh, Mr. Whitfield, you remember Mr. Whitfield? He was having great success at that time with open air or field preaching. He, he urged us to do likewise. <laughs> At first, very thought of preaching in the streets and fields of Paul, and I hesitated to leave anywhere. I was a child of the church, ordained in the church. I loved the cool, quiet elements and its high ceilings and carved beams. I loved rainbows filtering through stained glass tapestries. I loved the silent respect of a hushed, prayerful congregation. But a preacher in pride in this church is still a preacher nonetheless. So I took my traveling road for Jesus Christ to the worst sinners in all of England. The Kingswood Miners of Bristol. These wild, riotous men were thought to be subhuman by the respectable citizenry of Bristol. The miners came to look upon themselves in that light and lived accordingly. At first they came in tens and hundreds to jeer and ridicule, but when they learned the simple, sincere truth that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loved them so deeply, so intensely, that he died to save them from themselves, and then rose from the dead to show them the way home. Those tens and hundreds grew to ten thousand, and then no longer laughed in contempt, but buried their faces in their soap-covered hands and wept for the joy of the Lord. Oh, that's so Many wretched souls should come to God through Christ, and in this my first venture, a few preaching surprised me no end. Speaking of Bristol, I must relate this incident. You see, many, many were offended in the various manifestations of those upon whom the power of God came. I could scarce be heard amidst the groanings of some and the cries of others, calling aloud to him who was mighty to save. Well, a Quaker stood nearby and was not a little displeased at these various manifestations and was biting his lips and knitting his brow when he dropped down! The sun was struck! Oh, the agony he was in was even terrible to behold. We besought God not to lay folly to his charge and in a moment he, he lifted up his head and cried aloud, Now I know thou art a prophet of the God. And it struck me. We have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. It is not our business to, to preach so many times, but to save as many souls as possible, and with all God's power, build them up in that holiness without which they will not see the Lord. She said, John, 
John, until I heard what you and Charles and, and Mr. Whitfield were preaching, I had scarce heard such a thing mentioned as having forgiveness of sins now, or having God's Spirit bear witness for mine, much less did I imagine that this was the common privilege of all believers for that reason. I never dared ask for such an experience for myself, but then I read the paper which you wrote explaining what you are trying to preach, and then two or three weeks ago, while my brother-in-law, Reverend Hall, was pronouncing those words while delivering the communion cup to me, as I knelt before the rail, the words, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, struck through my heart. I knew, I knew that God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven me all my sins. My mother was 70 at that time. My age. Three years later, the silver cord of her life was loosening. We sat down on the side of her bed. Her look was calm and serene. Her eyes looked upwards as we commended her soul to God. Oh, she had no doubt, no fear, nor any desire but to depart and be with Christ. And then, without any struggle or sigh or groan, We stood round her bed and filled her last request, uttered a little before she lost her speech. Children, when I am released, sing a song of praise to God. Oh, oh for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of our God and King. Well, while I'm here, I thought perhaps I might give some news to you. Oh, preaching. Well, the 
reading the prayer in the afternoon worship sir. Oh, I see. Oh, you won't be needing any help. Oh, you prefer doing your own work. Oh, yes, yes, I understand. And I did understand. At least I tried to. My lack of popularity with the church leaders seemed to be growing with every passing day, along with my popularity with the crowds. It was important to my experience to be rejected by the religious leaders and accepted by the people. But our Lord experienced the same phenomenon of cross purposes, so I felt it was a good company. Well then, following a barbed cutting sermon by Mr. Romney, actually mentions a public announcement of me. I asked my, my, my traveling companion at that time, John Taylor, to give the following message to the people as they left the sanctuary. And I still retain a high degree of regard for the authority of the minister in his own parish. The question troubled me that whole afternoon, and I spent much time in prayer and searching thought over the matter. It was my church, where my brothers and sisters and I grew up, where my, where my sainted mother tutored us and, and wept over those she lost, where my father lies buried after 40 years of giving his all for God, where my father left. My father, the Lord had given me my answer. There was indeed a place I was welcome at every church. One place no man dared question my right to stand and preach. One place I could stand and preach with a confidence and conviction born of God's Holy Spirit. At six o'clock near the east end of the church, I made my way through the growing crowds as they milled about between the graves. The air was heavy with anticipation thick with the very stuff of which history is composed. Then, I stepped up onto the first rung of heaven and stood firmly and resolutely upon the great stone slab that covered the length and breadth of my father's grave. And from that water position before the largest crowd Edward had ever seen, I preached on life and death on heaven and hell. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Oh, I am well assured I did far more good to my upward parishioners by preaching three days on my father's grave than by preaching three years in his pulpit. The good people of that locality pressed me to remain longer, and thus, for eight evenings, I preached to ever-increasing multitudes, each night standing over my father's grave. On the final evening, a Saturday, my voice was drowned out by the cries of those seeking salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, so tender with the touch of heaven and the ties of friendship. Oh, we scarce knew how to part. I returned to Epworth again in January 1743, and once again, I was denied the privilege of the pulpit. Thus, once again, I repaired to the, the sanctuary of the Sabbath. But this time Mr. Romney even went so far as to deny me the sacrament of holy communion, branding me unfit to partake of the Lord's table. God's holy word tells us in Proverbs 12, 19, the lips of truth shall be established forever. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. A few years after these incidents at Epworth occurred, Mr. Romney lost his voice and with it his position. He then became a drunkard and a lunatic. And in that sad state, he died.
my it seems strange somehow speaking of my trials and persecutions in retrospect like this but well that is where they rightfully belong now in the past I have become I know not how an honorable man the scandal of the cross has ceased in all the British Empire. Rich and poor, papists and Protestants behave with courtesy, nay, goodwill toward me. It seems as if I've nearly completed my course and our Lord is about to give me an honorable discharge. <coughs> yes, my Lord. <clears throat> what? Hmm. Well, you're finished with the horses and you think it's time we continued on. The little thoroughbred has eaten up all the feed. <laughs> he must be fast. <laughs> oh, oh. No doubt you're right, my boy. No doubt you're right. Oh, no doubt he is right. Oh, I must be getting old stopping so long, reminiscing like this, but, well, I've enjoyed it just the same. And, it is getting the time for me to continue on. My dear Methodists and other fellow believers, I do not fear that you should cease to exist from the face of the earth, but I do fear lest you exist only as a dead sect, having a form of godliness, but have the power. The kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 Does your faith not stand in the wisdom of man or in the power of God? Nothing can be more plain than that the life of God and the soul does not continue unless we use all opportunities of communion with God, praying without ceasing. Not that you are always in the house of prayer, or neglect the opportunity of being there. I love prayer meetings, wish they were set up in every corner of town. Wherever you can, pastors, appoint prayer meetings. Pray whether you can or not. When you are cheerful, when you are heavy, pray with many words, a few. Nothing swallow up or entrench upon the hours of prayer. Nothing is of so much importance. But if you are alive, you will be useful to men. I am not useful to men, but this is only for a while. In a short time, I am to quit this tenement of clay and remove it to another state.
and you will, you will be saved. You and your whole household. Father, we thank you for the message that we have heard tonight. We are reminded that it is through Christ and Christ alone that we find peace with you. It is now that we pray if there be anyone here who has wandered from the path, may tonight be the night that they return to you through Christ and Christ alone. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we dismiss tonight, we would like to thank our dear brother Wesley by taking up a love offering. So if you would be kind enough, we'll have some ushers that are passing the plate. But what I'd like to do as the plate is being, being passed, as the plate is being passed, Say that ten times fast. I would like to invite our dear brother Wesley back, if he's willing to do so, for a few moments of question and answer.
I preached against it. I, I promoted uh, the cause of releasing them. I, I probably not quite as much as Wilberforce, but I was a strong advocate for, for them. Yes, you man. Do I have a horse named Fast? I do not. I have a horse who is fast, but he's 16 hands high. Perhaps I should train with a father. I wonder if you carry that horse around with you. So yes, yes, it balances your walk, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. What about your experience with Moravian in I see you've been reading my journals. Uh, did you hear the question? Uh, what did he uh, learn from the Moravians uh, in Germany after he was converted? What did I learn from the Moravians in Germany after I was converted? You see, shortly after I was converted on May 24th, or some have said, even I have said, assurance of salvation was given. You read me at different times, and one time I say I was saved, the other time I say I had assurance and salvation. Whatever the case, my life was never the same after that. So I'm not quickly aware of it. I've kind of forgotten the details. In fact, there is now a Wesleyan Holiness Digital Library, whdl.org, whatever that means. And you can go on and in five languages read about holiness literature. In fact, I've visited Michael's, he says, log me on, and I have read some of the things I, I wrote, and then what some of you have written about it, and I think you'll do better than I did. Um, what was the question? Oh, <laughs> Moravians. <laughs> yes, well, I found out when I met Count Zinzendorf, a wealthy German Count who got radically saved turned the property, his property over to the Moravians who were being persecuted. I found that I was intrigued by their theology, but as I left after six weeks, I, I had some differences, but I've never ceased to thank God for the original impact that the Moravians had. We parted a little bit theologically along the way, but God used them greatly. Were you ever with Count Zinzendorf? <laughs> you look a lot like him. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Yes, sir. Well, in another life, I was married to a half breed. My wife in Arkansas is Cherokee. Forty years later, she has not killed me yet. <laughs> However, you and I must one day lay aside all of our facades, all of our masks, that make us appear as though we are what we are not. And we'll lay all that down and the Lord will say, we pray, well done, our good and faithful servant. Enter thou into my rest. But if we do not receive Christ, then all the good news are like sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And what does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their salvation? You see, my own father came to Christ three days before he died, 17 years ago. My mother came to Christ just a few months ago, I was sitting by her bedside. And she came to Christ just days before she died at 92. And we praise God, but what kind of fruitful lives 
could they have lived if they had received Jesus on earth? Well, how much of that is true of you or I? Perhaps we know lots of stories about the Bible. Perhaps you know songs and curriculum and you're taught. And some of your gifts have bought the pews that you sit in and some of these windows. But do you know Christ as your Savior? Not about Him, but do you know Him? Was there ever a time when you said, Jesus, I need you, like my father did? I was 19 on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And I was writing a letter to a friend back home. I'm from the Northwest of Seattle area. And our cook came out on board from the ship, came out. We were 2,000 miles out. And he started to read his Bible. And I had never seen him read the Bible. And I asked him, why were you reading, Freddie, why were you reading the Bible? And he said, well, I'm glad you asked me. He shared his testimony. He asked me if I'd like to receive Christ. And he said, go on. He would finish my letter. He said, that's okay. Tonight, we will go to bed. You can receive Christ. And he shared with me the scriptures. And I did that night. And my heart was strangely warm. July 20th, 1966. But I not always can you point to a time and place. Maybe you were raised in the church and you became a Christian just through embracing truth, but don't go home to that without knowing and knowing that Jesus is your. Lord and Savior. It's not worth it. There's no need. Lay aside all this stuff. Be known for who you are. Own your own stuff. Don't cast blame. And allow Jesus Christ to change your life and the lives of those around you. I have the privilege on Tuesday at 2.30 to share a portion of the play with the folks over at the residence at Miller. Miller's system of it. And for those of you who might, might know, you might know down in Argus, Methodist, First United Methodist, I'll be there Wednesday nights and we can send folks and friends from other churches of, from that church invite them to come. Thank you so very much. Bless you. Pastor, do you want to say I have a point for all would you join me once again in just thanking BJ for his time? <laughs> one final time, I just want to remind you there are flyers and brochures in the back. His contact information is at the bottom. So if you have friends or family in other churches that you think would benefit from this wonderful experience, please feel free to take that information with you. Uh, I would like to ask if there are those of you who do not have to read the English and put your kids to bed at school tomorrow, um, we could use a little help helping BJ load his equipment back um, into his vehicle and, and just doing some general uh, cleanup. So if you have the time and would be willing to help us with that, that would be greatly appreciated. And if I may be so bold as to ask our dear brother to dismiss us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of coming before you now and this evening. Thank you, Lord, that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through you, not carnal. And those weapons allow us to pull down strongholds and cast, uh, uh, cast all of our imaginations away and to bring every one of our thoughts into the obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, may you break the strongholds in our life and point out any lies that we may be embracing. And may we be men and women, boys and girls, who are part of a revival in this part of Indiana, in this church, in this city, where people from all over the world will come and say, I don't know what's happening there, but God has shown up in Plymouth. And Lord, it starts with submitted lives, and I pray that every life here will be guilty of submitting to you.
and your fullness.